Hi, and welcome back to The Wandering Wesleyan. This is Chaplain Greg. Uh, so glad that you are here today watching my video. And uh, if you are enjoying the content that I'm putting out, please like and subscribe, leave a comment, share the videos with folks, and uh, we will get this into more hands. If uh, you are enjoying what we're talking about, or maybe you disagree with some of the things I'm talking about, please leave a comment. I reply to all the comments that come to me. Um, you can also email me at wanderingwesleyan at hotmail.com and uh, I, I'm happy to interact with you there. So we are continuing with our Stories of the Rabbi series and the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we are going to pick up in chapter 1, uh, verse, verses 9 through 11. Uh, if you remember, we have started, we've jumped right into the ministry. We've talked about John the Baptist and, and his ministry. We've talked about uh, uh, the introduction that came here, but now we're gonna jump into the baptism of Jesus. Jesus is showing up really early in the book. Verse nine, here comes Jesus. So chapter one, verse nine, uh, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As soon as he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens op being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice from heaven, you are my beloved son and with you, I am well pleased. Oh my goodness, this is so huge. Now, uh, one of the things I want you to notice is how short a narrative this is, whereas the other gospels spend far more time on, on this. So first of all, Jesus is identified as coming from a town of Nazareth. Most Judeans probably would not have heard of Nazareth. Um, it's in the northern part of Galilee, north of the Sea of, uh, uh, the sea of Galilee, and um, was probably a very small town of, oh, I, I gotta imagine less than 100 people. Um, it was a really small backwoods town. Um, but this is where he's identified as coming from. Verse 10, all right, we're coming up to John's, I'm sorry, to Mark's very most favorite word, immediately. Oh, immediately, you will get this word constantly, all through, immediately, suddenly, then, suddenly, then. Um, all, all of this iteration of the same word um, is a way for Mark to keep, keep the action going, but also it's a way for him to transition. It's a way for him to transition from one scene to another scene. So immediately is a word that you're gonna see over and over again. Um, so verse 10, immediately a sense of instantaneous identification of Jesus as son of God with the presence of the other members of the Trinity. So the, the, the spirit is coming down on him like a dove and a voice from heaven being the father, you are my beloved son with you, I am well pleased. So why did Jesus need to be baptized? If he is God, and he most certainly is going to be claiming to be God throughout the gospel. Um, if he is God, why does he need to ba be baptized? Does he need to repent? No, no, he didn't need to repent. He was God, he was perfect. He never committed sin. He was baptized in order to identify with Israel's need to repent. It was a symbolic foreshadowing of his substitutionary role as the Lamb of God. The Lamb in the temple was the one that was sacrificed for the sins of the nation. And so he is, being a symbolic foreshadow of, of identifying with the, with the Jewish people by being baptized. The Spirit of God. Now this is important. The Spirit of God is going to take in the New Testament an entirely new definition. So in the Old Testament, the spirit or the presence of God was always over there. You saw God over there. He was in the temple. He was in the tabernacle. Occasionally he would rest, <clears throat> rest on a prophet. Occasionally he would uh, be on a group of people for a time and then gone. Okay. The Holy Spirit was visited upon specific times for specific tasks. 
the presence of God was in the temple, was in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, and was not accessible by everyone. In fact, it was only, he, it was only accessible by the priest once a year. So this is a brand new thing where the Holy Spirit is gonna come and rest on Jesus permanently. The Spirit and the presence of God is on Jesus permanently. Now, was Jesus, was Jesus not God before this? No, he was perfectly God. What Mark is doing is he's pulling together all three members of the Trinity. Now, in the Gospels, and especially with the first Christians, this idea of Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they were still working this through. You can see that in the first chapter of John. Um, my last video that I gave for the Walking in the Word series was largely on John chapter one. And you can see that he's working through this language, trying to talk about this idea of God being one being three persons. And I think that's what we're seeing here, is Mark is trying to describe what this is. It would take us really over 300 years until the uh, Council of Nicaea, when we were, when the church was finally able to put language to this idea of Trinity. It's still tough to talk about. It's still tough to describe because we have a limited, non-eternal language to describe unlimited, eternal things. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, we're gonna finish up this particular section, uh, verses 12 and 13, with the temptation of Jesus. Uh, Matthew and Luke, again, take a lot more time to talk about these things, but here we have Mark's favorite word. Immediately, the Spirit, so the Holy Spirit, drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, where have we heard 40 days before? Being tempted by Satan, he was with wild animals and the angels were serving him. All right, very brief compared to Matthew 4, 1 through 11 and Luke 4, 1 through 13. Mark uses stronger language than Matthew or Luke in that the Spirit drove him or propelled or cast him out into the wilderness. It seems to be an affirmation that Jesus was fully prepared for the ministry he was about to embark on for the rest of the book. Now, I'm not going to get into a, a theological overview of the temptation of Jesus because that would be for a study of Matthew or Luke, that you would dive into that. This short little narrative is really affirming that Jesus is about ready to embark on his ministry and he is fully prepared. He has been baptized, marked with the Holy Spirit, survived temptation with the enemy, and off he goes. And that brings us to the next section. And this is Mark chapter one, verses 14 through 38. This is the next chapter. So, Verses 14 and 15 is an initiation into ministry. So verse 14, after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, gospel. Remember, we talked about that last week, the gospel. The time is fulfilled. This is Jesus talking. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news, the gospel. Repentance prepares God's people for his work. So Jesus is calling on the people to repent. And the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come. Repent and believe the good news. All right, let's go, let's go deeper into this. This was after John was arrested. So Mark is making a definite cut here with John the Baptist. John the Baptist's ministry is over. Jesus' ministry has begun. 
his public ministry, John the Baptist's public ministry has come to an end. Jesus, his ministry can now commence. This is all happening in Galilee. All of Jesus' ministry in the, in the Gospel of Mark happens in Galilee, but is then transferred to Jerusalem in chapter 11. Things go really quickly up until chapter 11, then things slow down quite a bit. There's no mention of other Jerusalem visits or the visit to the Samaritan, Samaritans. Um, the ministry is no longer in the wilderness, but now it's come to the people. And the focus of Mark is on Galilee. Doesn't mean that he didn't go to the other places. It's not contradicting the other gospels. It just means this is how Mark designed his narrative under the influence of the Holy Spirit. All right now, Caruso, proclaim, preach, announce, euangelion, the good news, the gospel. Now, where does this good news come from? This is important. So the euangelion in, in those times, if you heard that word, you would think that the Caesar or the emperor of Rome was going to make a grand announcement. He's going to get married. He's going to have another son, another heir. Another heir has been born. That would be euangelion. It is a proclamation from the king about the king. The word was used to describe announcements to the people about the king. It's kingship activity. The gospel is kingship activity. There's also a mention here of something that is going to come up over and over again, and that is the kingdom of God in verse 15. The kingdom of God is something that is now breaking into our time and space in the person of Jesus. The good news is the kingdom of God, is Jesus. We're going to get into that more as we go on. Now, verse 15. This is the theme of Mark's gospel. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The time is fulfilled. Jewish people have been waiting centuries for the Messiah to arrive. Now, by this time, they think he's going to be a military guy. They think he's going to be a guy who um, is going to come and conquer the Romans and drive them out. Well, no, that's not who Jesus is. Jesus is a different kind of Messiah, but they have been waiting. The time has been fulfilled. We've talked about the kingdom of God. Um, again, the, this mention of the kingdom of God would be another insult to Rome, okay? Because Rome was considered the kingdom of God, right? Okay, so if the emperor is God, the son of God, well, what is the Roman Empire? That's the kingdom of God. But Mark is saying something different. The kingdom of God is now here in this person of Jesus, so deep it's so wonderful and we're going to get into this this kingdom of god is going to come up over and over we're going to unpack that more as we go on the words it is at hand means it's here it's now it's not someday down the road it's here and now and this is something that uh, a theologian by the name of george eldon ladd talked about the already and the not yet so the kingdom of God has arrived, but it isn't in its fullness completion. We still have the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension. We have the sending of the Holy Spirit, the establishment of the church, the church going out to the Samaritans and then to the Gentiles and then to the whole world and then to us and to the people after us until Jesus comes back and sets up and fulfills and completes his kingdom. The kingdom of God is here. It's here now, partially. Someday it's gonna be here in its fullness with new creation, but it's here now. The kingdom of God is not something that we're waiting for. We're waiting for its fulfillment, but it's here with us 
now. And then believe, pesteu, believe, trust, faith. Put your trust in this good news that the kingdom of God has arrived. Put your trust in the UN Galeon, the gospel, the good news. All right, this brings us to verse 16. I'm finally turning the page in my Bible. We've, we've spent a lot of time on that first page, but it's time to move on. So verses 16 through 20, let's talk about that. This is the calling of the first disciples. So 16 through 20, as he passed through the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew and Simon's brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus said to them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, Mark's favorite word, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, Zebedee and his brother John in a boat putting their nets in order. What did he do? Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. All right. Simon, Andrew, James, John, and Zebedee. So we have, we have five people here. All of these guys were fishermen. And James, John, Simon, and Andrew all received the command, Duete ego, come, come away, follow, follow me. James and John left their, their dad right in the boat there, and all four had the same reaction. Euthus straight away immediately. Euthus is that word that Mark loves immediately. Disciples usually sought out teachers. Now this is important because Jesus is going to these four guys and he is finding them and seeking them. For a rabbi in the first century during this time that we're reading about People applied to be with him. If he was of note, if he was of notoriety, people would make an application and men, sorry gals, women weren't allowed to do that, only, only the fellows. So um, they would apply and um, if they were good enough, if they were smart enough, then the rabbi would take them in and they would sit at his feet and they would be taught. Jesus is breaking this mold. We're going to see this over and over again. Jesus breaking the mold. And he calls out these four men. Jesus goes to them. Hear that because it's so important. Jesus goes to them. Jesus goes to you. Jesus is going to you now. Jesus came to me and called me and said, would you be my follower? Everybody has a different way of being called but everybody gets called. And these four guys, Jesus went to them and called them to be his disciples. And this is where we're gonna leave it for today. He's got four disciples now, a lot has happened. He's been baptized, he's been tempted, he's started his first, uh, his, his ministry and he's called his first four dudes to be with him, a uh, lot more going to happen and we are really going to jump into it next week. So until then, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. Um, put some comments in the comment section. Uh, share it with other folks. And until then, God bless you. This is Greg Johnston, The Wandering Wesleyan.